talking to Shyla's books. Welcome back to my channel. Um, it has been brought to my attention that when I use my webcam, I have like some background noise that's kind of distracting. So I really apologize. I literally just cannot help it for today. I was going to try to film on my phone, which is like perfect. I'm out of storage. So anyways, this is all the things that I read in March. I read a ton. So we are going to be here for a minute. Uh, in the month of March, I read 14 books. Now, three of those were books from the Shadowhunters series thing, which are included in another vlog. One of those is from the Vampire Academy read along. We read book four, Blood Promise. We talk about that book in the live show. Three other books I read for another reading vlog called Spring Cleaning Reading Vlog. Um, I don't believe I actually summed up those books in that video, so I will talk about them in this video. In fact, that's where we're gonna start. The first book I read for that vlog is All in Pieces by Suzanne Young. This book was actually really touching and sad story. I just can't, I think we all have basically a soft spot for kids who just really don't have the greatest support system at home, kind of left to their own devices and have to grow up too fast and do things that the parents should do. This is about a high school teen who attends this alternative school. I guess that she had gotten into some trouble, so she winds up at this alternative school. Her mom left her and her little brother, and her little brother has autism. I believe he's about six or seven, so he's pretty young. But they were left behind with their alcoholic father, who doesn't work. Our main character tries her best to take care of her little brother. She does absolutely everything for him, getting him to school on time, making sure he's got breakfast and dinner and lunch. I mean, she's the parent now. On top of also going to school herself and staying on top of all of her things. They barely scrape by with enough money for groceries and oftentimes she will go without to make sure that her brother has what he needs. At school she meets this guy who shows an interest in her but he is from a rich family he, and she just kind of doesn't trust where he's coming from. But anyways, I basically flew through this book. It was really good. Not typically the kind of thing that I read. I think I gave this book probably like a 3.5 to 4, 3.5 stars. The next book I read was Switched by Amanda Hawking. This was an absolute surprise. It's the first in the Trill series and I really enjoyed this. Mostly just because it's quite unique because the Trill are actually trolls. The main character has always felt like an outsider. Her mother is institutionalized because when she was a baby, her mother tried to kill her. Her mother also consistently insists that she is an imposter and she was supposed to have a son. Instead, she got this monster. So we learned that our main character is actually a troll, but there's like different troll clans and one of them is trying to kill her or take her or something. So they send someone to watch her and bring her home because her troll abilities are emerging sooner than normal. I really like this. I thought it was a complete surprise. I didn't really know what I was getting into. The back of the book says something about like, um, her mother tries to kill her. She's like a monster. She might've been right. No idea it was about trolls. I also kind of like that trolls, like she describes herself that she's not like a beauty. She has this wild unruly hair and we find out that, that is a troll trait. I think that it's really interesting because it brings out a unique style of, of beauty standards. Definitely your typical young adult romance aspect to the plot. It's a forbidden love, which we don't learn about till later, but it is a forbidden love and you can see it coming from a mile away, but it's still a lot of fun to watch it develop. The hierarchy and like the politics of the trolls is really interesting and it's not fully developed within the full book because obviously there's a lot to learn still as the series goes on. I kind of want to know where it's going, why she's so special, and I want to learn a little bit more about like the trolls and like their powers and things like that. However, I don't think at least at this time that I'm going to make a point to continue on with the series. If I like need an audiobook to check out, I would probably check out the audiobook. But my my overall interest is just kind of mild just because I just feel like in general I'm kind of outgrowing those types of stories while they're entertaining. 
I want to start reading books that are going to hit me hard and stay with me for a really long time. And there's just not enough time in the universe to read everything, but it was really fun, enjoyable read. The next book I read is Ultraviolet by RJ Anderson. I read this book in one sitting and I'm not, I don't mean that it's like, I just mean that it was really easily digestible. It doesn't mean that it was a phenomenal book either. It just had me, something in it had me. I just had to know more. So this girl has this condition which is called, oh, there's a name for it. It's like synthesis, then synthesis. I don't know what it's called. But basically it's this phenomena that where people can, like she can taste when people lie. She can see words like in colors and things like that. She winds up in an institution because she can't remember what happened, but she was with her best friend and her best friend disappeared and she has blacked it out. And she thinks that she killed her. This was really heavy on the mental health she can't really trust what she thinks she knows. A new psychologist shows up to work with her and he's the first and only person that she feels like she can trust, she can open up to about her senses. He believes her and makes her feel safe. But then we find out something shady about the psychologist and we enter into a whole nother theme about inappropriate relationships and kind of the betrayal that one could feel being in such a vulnerable situation. That part like had me. But then as the truth emerges, it turns into this whole alien sci-fi thing. It was interesting. I have to say, I was really excited about the science fiction aspect of it, but it was actually kind of surprising because I didn't like that aspect as much. And I much more preferred our main character, especially especially her relationship. Again, it's surprising to me because it's so heavily on the mental health. Um, oh, I think like the institutionalized setting isn't usually my cup of tea either. But I think I really, when we got to like the big theme of inappropriate relationships, like I said, I really liked that part, but I was a little disappointed with like the ending and stuff. It is the first in a series. I had the first two books. If you go and watch that vlog, you'll see, um, but I didn't like it enough to continue on with the series. Getting into the other books, I think I'm gonna save the best for last. So I finally got to read a Haruki Murakami book. In fact, I read two Haruki Murakami books. I read, I listened to an audiobook and I actually read one on an ebook. Let's start with After Dark. So I read After Dark on ebook. I have been dying to read this book for so long. I believe it was Emmy's favorite book of last year, one of her favorite books of last year. And the way she described it, I just knew that that was something I had to read. I was actually pretty surprised at how short After Dark was. It's just about 200 pages. It all takes place in the span of one night. We meet a bunch of different like quirky characters. There's like this big diner scene and there's a love hotel and a girl who is basically just escaping from her estranged sister who is basically just been sleeping for two months straight. It honestly sounds really bizarre. I think other people have explained this book so much better than I can, but overall, I really enjoyed this book. So the next one I read is Norwegian Wood by Haruki Murakami. Again, this takes place in the 60s, and this is about a guy called Toru and his relationship with Naoko. Naoko? I think you say her name that way. And his relationship with Naoko. That's literally how it's spelled, but Thinking back, I don't think that's how you pronounce it. Naoko is overwhelmed with the grief of their friend, of their of their mutual friend's death. So she goes away to kind of sort it all out. Again, this is kind of difficult to explain. So Toru is at, in college and he's, we start out this book with getting to know Naoko, Toru, and their friend. And they're all in college together, but then the friend dies. Naoko goes away, Toru stays at school, and he makes different friends while he still is checking in on Naoko. He makes a friend that is, goes out to bars and picks up ladies. So he kind of does that with him. He meets another friend called Midori. And just like After Dark, we just follow Toru through a lot of different conversations. But those conversations are raw and honest, sometimes shocking and hilarious. They're sad, and especially conversations that he has with Midori, 
They openly discuss things that like normal people just would not like talk about openly, I feel like, in such intricacies and detail of like sexual things. I feel like Meadery kind of is basically this unrealistic person. Like some of the things she says are so shocking, you're like, no. Although watching other reviews and critiques of her Murakami's work, this is a common theme and style with Murakami's work, which kind of adds to that like magical dreamlike state of, of like the narrator's perspective and ideals. Anyway, each character t teaches Toru something, and it's oftentimes in a really subtle way. Like, each of the characters have such unique personalities. I feel like Midori at least started out as one of my favorites because Naoko is so emo, <laughs> and Midori has a lot to be sad about. She's like lost so many people close to her due to cancer, and she talks openly about it, and then she will like just kind of I don't want to say that she's crazy, but sometimes it feels like she's crazy. Conversations with Meadery often will like cycle through so many different subject matters from like the death of someone to something hilarious, but she cycles through all of these different things with the same spunk and energy. And she just has like no filter. She says like whatever is on her mind. It's just really refreshing after getting over the shock of like something that she says, you have to appreciate the honesty in it as well. Like she does not hold back. She actually makes a comment on, she's just tired of people not saying what they mean. And there's some really great lines about life, but the ending, like what the fuck? I had to rewind to listen to it again because I was like, that's where you're leaving off on this book. You can't do this to me. I really want a copy of this book one day so that I can highlight and annotate this book. I found myself like laughing out loud in some of these during this book. The next one I read is Legend Born by Tracy Dion. I read this book for the Dark Academics Book Club. This follows Brie, she's 16, but she was accepted to early entrance into like a college program. So she and her best friend are at this college. They are dorming and taking college courses. She is dealing with the grief of her mother's death and while she's there, she discovers a secret society and she believes that they somehow might know more about her mother's death. This secret society might be her ticket to finding out the truth. So she finds a way to get an in so she can find out more information on what really happened. But I think that she gets a lot more than she bargained for and she can't just like get in and get out. This book was really good. I thought that the part that really struck out to me was the way that people treat her. She is a black girl and a lot of conversations about like how she got into the school, some people immediately think of her as, oh, well, you must have got in on such and such merit or whatever. And she's like, no, I didn't, thanks a lot. <laughs> I thought that that was really excellent. There's also other conversations about how like she's the only black girl within the secret society and how it feels, other assumptions about her. This book is also a retelling of King Arthur and like the Knights of the Round Table. So unfortunately I couldn't connect so much to the plot as I really wanted to. I thought that the magic system was really unique. I did really like that. But when we started getting into the Knights of the Round Table lore, it really kind of lost me. The only other like retelling I read was The Guinevere Deception by Kristen White. And again, like I really liked our main character, Guinevere. I liked the whole like switched bodies and magic system. I really liked all of that thing. But again, just something could not grab my attention with the whole Knights of the Round Table lore. So I feel pretty sad about that. Sometimes I wonder if it's maybe just because I haven't read the original, um, but I don't really see myself going back and reading the original. I don't know. 10, 54, 11. Shoot, I gotta leave in like 30 minutes. I should be able to wrap this up. Oh no, wait, is it 12 or 12.30? I think it's 12.30. The next one I read is The Lost Apothecary by Sarah Penner. This was a really surprising book. I basically inferred what the book would be about by the title, Apothecary, you know, but it didn't really look much deeper. So I was quite surprised when I was expecting like a young adult fantasy, but it wasn't. In fact, I guess it's more like a maybe historical magical realism, maybe not even magical realism, 
but I would say it's probably geared a little bit more for adults. Not that there's any like serious adult themes. It's just that our one of our main characters is a divorcee. And the storytelling, I guess, is just kind of what I would more expect out of an adult novel. But really, I think anyone could enjoy it. This follows a dual timeline. One is like in the 1790s and one is in modern day. Our modern day narrator character that we follow has just discovered that her husband has cheated on her. They were supposed to take a vacation to London together, but since the infidelity, she takes her ticket and she goes on her own to kind of get space and try to sort out some things without him. Before she married him, she was set to be an, a historian. That's what she went to school for, but her life had just gone down a different path. So while she's in London, she rekindles her love for history with this mystery of the lost apothecary. And she also gets help from a librarian. Now the other timeline is the actual story of what happened in 1790 and we follow this little girl who, but she's under the care of this woman who bosses her around and tells her all the stuff to do. I forget what you would call it, like kind of like a maid, I don't know. Then she kind of goes to apprentice under this woman who runs the Lost Apothecary. It is really dark. It was really, really good and I loved it. I really love anything to do with poisons and period pieces. And the research aspect was really cool. I think the self-discovery of our modern day woman was really impo Im impactful. And the research that they were doing is really interesting in conjunction with what actually happened because all the research they have is all based on records and statements from police reports. And all of that stuff can only tell them so much. In a way, they will never know the entire story. Thankfully, as the reader, we do get to see what actually happened, but when you kind of pair it with what the modern day people actually know about the events, they there are definitely some details that they'll never really know. I guess what I liked so much about that is it really plays into this discussion that I watched from a booktuber live show. I'll try to find it and link it below, but they were talking about historical accuracy and how people like to be like the gatekeepers or police what is historically accurate and what they did wrong and how we probably shouldn't think of historical pieces that way just because there are certain details we just can never know. Honestly, I believe it's about a 90 minute show. You should definitely go check it out though. They explain it all so much better, but this kind of reminded me of that discussion and I just really liked that. The next one I read was Rebel Bell by Rachel Hawkins. I feel like I've talked about this one a lot, <laughs> um, mostly just because I beat it to death in like a vlog. But if you haven't watched those vlogs, you might not have heard me talk about it. Anyways, uh, this is about a girl named Harper. She is a Southern Belle. I believe she lives in like Alabama. She is like top of her class, working towards cotillion, like all the things. So it was quite a shocker when she Oh, when she excuses herself to the restroom at homecoming and the janitor barges into the restroom like bleeding and dying and he kisses her and then dies. Then the history teacher comes in chasing the janitor obviously with a big sword and Harper discovers then that she has been bestowed this duty of paladin. She was gifted with special powers and the duty to protect someone. When she discovers who she's supposed to protect, she's like, what? What first grabbed my attention about this book is because it was supposed to be very Buffy-esque and it definitely was, but instead of Southern California, it was in the Southern Belle culture. Basically my cup of tea. I ended up really liking this book, but there was a big chunk in the middle where I was just, it was really hard to get through. <laughs> the whole premise was, really good. I knew going into this book, it wasn't going to be excellent writing. And I was prepared for that. And I was going to overlook it and just enjoy the fun of the story. It was an action packed young adult fantasy novel. The writing was just a bigger challenge than I had expected, making it quite a struggle to get through. But as the story picked up towards the like last third or quarter of the book, it got so much better. However, I still felt like the ending was quite anticlimactic and therefore did not propel me to pick up the next book in the series. So that was kind of a bummer, but I read it, I got through it. So 
moving on. The next book I read, I don't have a lot to say about it. I'm just saying that I read it. It is called The Flowers of Evil or Le, F Le Fleur de Malm by Charles Boudelier. This was another poetry recommendation from Emmy. Honestly, I'm not setting out to read everything that she has recommended. I just happen upon it and I'm like, oh, she recommended that, pick that up. Anyways, this is another book of poems. I read most of them. Some were quite catching and others just could not get into it at all. Many of the themes in most of the most of them were flowers. Uh, most of this, I don't know if it's symbolism, probably symbolism since it's poetry, but a lot of the poems within this collection had flowers mentioned, so it's kind of pretty. That's really all that I can say about that one. I'm really glad that I gave it a try, but it didn't like stick with me, so. The next one I read is The Secret History by Donna Tartt. I finally finished this one. I feel like I've been talking about this one about every single month. I was really happy to take my time with this though. This is an iconic dark academic book. Actually, it's sitting over there, but we're just dig digital covers this whole round. Anyways, this follows Richard, who is a scholarship student at a prestigious Vermont college, where he decides to take Greek and study classic language and classic literature. I think they kind of go in hand in hand as part of this exclusive program. Really, he just wanted to go study Greek, but in order to study Greek, he had to sign up to do this whole classics program. That's how that all worked. He doesn't seem like a very purposeful character. He doesn't really have a direction. He just kind of going with the flow. This program is run by a professor. I completely forgot his name. I want to say it's like, it's not Arthur. It's not Arthur. Adrian? It doesn't really matter. His class is not a listed class. He is very particular about who he accepts into the program. They must follow specific rules, I guess, in order to stay in the program. It's kind of weird. He also keeps it incredibly small. He will only consider students under extenuating circumstances. So Richard finds him and begs him for a position. Grant, so obviously he's granted a place. The school, the dean really doesn't like this class and doesn't seem to have hold this professor in high regards. He believes that the whole study is just completely outdated. So anyways, long story short, we have this tiny little group of Greek geeks who have this real passion for the language and the culture. And honestly, in that kind of respect, it reminds me a little bit of the that villain's book where they're the Shakespeare trope. They welcome Richard right away. They also tend to dress a certain way that Richard tries to emulate, but also he struggles because he isn't loaded. He doesn't trust fun child like all the other kids. They wind up spending all of their time drinking and doing drugs and basically sitting around having conversations. In fact, this entire book and this entire story is all relayed through conversations that Richard has been privy to. So we don't know about it unless Richard knows about it. So anything about the characters, anything about the events going on, all have to be pieced together from one conversation to another conversation. And that lead up to the murder. <laughs> Dark Academic, there's a murder. This is absolutely a slower paced book. I think I've mentioned that many times. Uh, this is a slower paced book. I can absolutely see why it's definitely not for everybody. People do either love it or hate it. I really love this book. I can't say that I'm like a die hard fan of it. I mean, just to begin with, it's, I, I only get like total fangirl about fantasies. I do really love this book. I actually would like to reread it just because I want to pick out some of the lines and references to literature and some of the quotations that they reference. I felt like each character is very interesting. They're not supposed to be likable, but the two main characters are Henry and Bunny and obviously Richard. There's some other characters in their group as well, but they're just not as interesting, I would say. They just kind of like background characters, kind of go along with the flow. But the most interesting characters are Bunny and Henry. And Richard is also basically a background character. He's just there to relay the story to us. He's our token outsider who is not from the trust fund group. So naturally, everyone con everyone mentions that this book is very pretentious. That's kind of the point. And I'm totally there for it. Like trust fund kids who never have to worry about money. I mean, in a way, Bunny kind of is different. <laughs> 
I guess something I really like about it is because I feel like I know people like them. I've grown up with people like these people. On on the the air on the the better side, um, and also air on the like morally gray side, because I I just one of our characters is just like our characters are less concerned that somebody died and that it was wrong and was like morally hard hitting, and they're just concerned with they're not going to jail. And it's more like a decision. Like they could care less that somebody is dead. And granted, anyone who has killed someone by accident or on purpose obviously doesn't want to go to jail. But it's like a completely different motivation. I can't even explain it because you just have to like read it and get to know the characters and see how they react. And the conversations they have regarding this dead person. It's almost like, I hate to say that it's hilarious, but it is. Because in most books that I read personally, whenever there's like a dead person, they're like grieving over the fact that there's a human being who is no longer alive and that whole um, personal guilt. And these characters have none of that. It's not about that at all. It's how it's going to affect their lives. No personal or emotional recourse. I wouldn't even necessarily say that they feel that they're above the law Although they do, sort of, but it's more just like he never really says like I don't deserve it. He just like he's just not going. Period. Don't want to do it. Not gonna go. I just like it somehow that this personality trait was so strong. So I need to say I really enjoyed that book. I know we've been here a long while. I've got two more. The next one is let's go ahead and do From Ash and Blood by Jennifer L. Armentrout. Okay, so let's start with the summary. This is the first book in a series by Jennifer L. Armentrout. We follow Poppy, who is the maiden. She was chosen from birth and raised to have the sole purpose of being the maiden. She lives in a castle with the Duke and the Duchess. She has absolutely no control over anything in her life. She's forbidden to be unveiled in front of anybody, save for a very select few, like her lady's maid, her personal guard, they obviously have to know what she looks like, and the Duke and Duchess when it's called for. While she's a treasure in the future of their society, danger constantly surrounds her. Enemies want to kidnap her or kill her, plus some personal in-house things that happen to her that she cannot retaliate, cannot object to. She just has to allow it to happen to her. Uh, it's pretty disgusting. Also, she's at a crossroads with herself. She should be happy to fulfill her duty. However, she's kept in the dark. That duty, what exactly it entails, and as the time gets closer for her to ascension, she gets more and more restless and unsure. She starts having this need to want to experience life that she fears that after ascension, she will no longer be able to ever do again. I really had no idea what I was getting into when I started this book. I didn't even know it was a vampire story. Basically, I was just happy to be reading another JLA book. It kind of reminds me of the Vampire Academy series because there's like different types of vampires. Also, they're not really called vampires and they never really come out and say what they are. Like as you're discovering the world, you just kind of put two and two together, puncture wounds on the neck. You're like, it's a vampire, it's a vampire. But who are the vampires? Are they like completely different? Is it these suspicious ascendant people? Is, is that what they're really about? Because we don't know, we don't know anything. I know I did watch one review where this was a trait about the storytelling style that somebody really didn't like, but I really enjoyed it. There actually is something called vampies, but once you, it, it's not like said so until like we just, we get there in the future. Anyways, the vampire hierarchy is something in of itself. Then there's the political climate, which is a whole other thing, which I feel like also ties in with the religious thing, which I found really fascinating because these people in power basically keep the civilians in line with the threat of religion and their duty. That's really not something that you see that often, I feel like in fantasy, especially, especially modern fantasy. So I really like this. In reality, for so long, our culture was defined by religious beliefs. So many decisions are made based off of religious beliefs and people used those religious beliefs to control and exploit people. There's this point that really feeds into my cynicism of regarding like organized religion and those who fear for a higher being to make people behave, except when it better serves them to break said rule. It was so good. And it calls into question their whole belief system. And you're like, 
Who's lying here? Hmm? Then we have the obvious love story. I really liked this too. Even though there's definitely a predictability to it, it was only a really predictable up into a point. And then I was blown away with how they twist. Like I kind of suspected things, but it didn't turn out quite how I, how I expected, if that kind of makes sense. This was such an amazing book. I had so many feelings about this book. I felt so angry and betrayed. I cried a little bit. Such a good book to me. Um, however, there is a trigger warning for, I would say probably sexual assault and actually physical assault in this book. There are some descriptions that are quite gory as well, but I like that kind of thing. So, and lastly, the last book I read was A Court of Silver Flames by Sarah J. Mass. This is the fourth in the Court of Thorns and Roses series. <laughs> I really considered making a separate video just for this book, just to do a review, but as it stands, I got to move some things along here. Lots of stuff going on lately. So the whole Court of Thorns and Roses series basically is characterized as Beauty and the Beast retelling. However, that's only up until the first book. That's really only true for the first book. Beyond that, it's this whole grand fantasy with fairies. This book, however, follows one of the sisters, Nesta Archeron and Cassian, as Nesta comes to terms with her new fayness and her grief and trauma. I was able to get this book on audiobook, and to be honest, I'm thankful that I didn't go out and buy this book. I'm glad that I read it, but it's a beast of a book, and I don't think I would have had the patience to read each page. The book runs about 757 pages, and I really don't have a problem with big ass books, but I would say that like 80% of this book were lengthy, graphic, and sometimes cringy sex scenes. Cringy because of the way they explain certain things, sometimes just way too much. And if they weren't actively doing it, they were thinking about doing it. And there was lengthy descriptions of how their bodies were reacting and getting aroused. Yeah, it was just a lot. It was a lot. Now, I talk about some details of in a vlog that I just did. However, I kind of just want to insert the vlog that I did here because I talk about it like when it was fresh. Like I don't mind if that's what they wanted to do is make, you know, fairy erotica. Like the original three books have some steamy scenes, but the first three books were fantasy with some steamy scenes. This book seriously got its priorities twisted because it is like 80% sex scenes and then 20% plot. So I kind of felt disappointed in that because I was expecting it the other way, you know, more fantasy. Some of the descriptions were extremely dramatic and a lot of it could, I mean, I could give credit to the narrator of the audiobook for maybe over dramatizing certain things, but it was dramatic and overwritten. And each sex scene was like trying to outdo the last one. A lot of the descriptions were overused. I felt like with each new sex scene, we had to describe certain things the same way. And they don't leave any action up to the imagination at all. A little bit less would be more. I kind of wish I would have done a reaction video and called out some things, like some descriptions, but maybe next time. Two of my favorite reviewers had done us all the great service of mentioning a couple things. First, Pierre Ford's video. That every Illyrian male has to have the world's biggest penis. Softer than silk or velvet. You know who's got a velvet dick? Rowan. You know whose dick was related to silk? Reesons. This is softer than even that. I need people, I need these men to stop roaring when they come. Because all I can imagine is like, Rah! and it's just, it's not sexy. It's not just a moan or a grunt is fine. Uh, an exhale of the word fuck is fine. Like I just, what do you mean roar? It's the roaring and the snarling for me. Like I can't, the snarling I always imagine is more just like a, like a, but it's the, I can't, I cannot do that. She's not even responsive and he just fucking tongues her in front of everyone. And everyone's just like, I would, oh, I would be so uncomfortable. I'm so sick of men calling it your sex. And there you have it. Yeah, that was a thing. So now that we've covered that, had to get it out of the way first before I could really think about the other things of this book. Let's talk about the plot. Cassian and Nesta. I like it. I think we all can agree that Nesta was a wretched, horrible character from the get-go. Like, I fucking hate it. And we're all supposed to. But also we're supposed to feel the hate that she has for herself and how she overcomes it. And I really 
liked that journey. Like it took a long time, but that's how those things happen. They don't just happen overnight. You're not like, oh, okay, I'm Faye, everything's fine now. So sometimes I kind of get bogged down in that headspace. I did it with um, the book where Feyre was like really going through it too. And I was just like, oh my God, this just keeps going and going and going. That's just, that's like me trying to like, I need to stop being so critical in that respect because like it is real like that. It's not a good time, but it's part of their character development. When I look at the book retrospectively and see how far she's come, wow, you know, I really enjoyed that journey. And I feel like it was done really well. And I feel like it was done completely different the way, than the way Feyre found her peace. Nesta was so consumed with self-loathing that she didn't even realize when she like quit thinking about her misery and started to heal. I really liked where her healing came from. As, like it came from such an unexpected place and she resented it all. Like the first thing was they were like, you either do this thing or you're kicked out. So grudgingly she did it and she hated every second of it and she would fight it and fight it. In a sense, I can completely relate to her because I can be that stubborn sometimes. I don't even know. It's like, then you get to like this point where you feel like, like you just have to hate it for the sake of hating it because it's not something that you chose to do. But one last thing about Nesta, and this is not something I considered until after watching Allie's vlog on it, but something she said made so much sense. Allie talks about how she really enjoyed the fact that the, the basically her character is normalizing women being promiscuous or dealing with her trauma through like drinking and sleeping around. And I have to say that when I when we look at it like that, it makes so much more sense. Like that is a realistic coping mechanism. I can really get on board with her character and her character development. My favorite parts of this book were the friendships that she made at the library. I feel like each of those characters were pretty interesting. In fact, I'd like to get to know them just a little bit more. I got really attached to them. Mostly I got attached to them as a group. And the house, I love the house. That is such a fun aspect. Everyone keeps bringing up the swamp scene and that is definitely an epic scene. I love that scene. There's actually a lot of great stuff about this book and looking at Nessa's character from where she was and how far she had come, especially her guilt, because I feel like that helps us, the reader, kind of also kind of hold her character a little bit accountable for how wretched she's been. Like she should feel guilty. I'm glad she feels guilty, but I'm also glad to see that she sees that in herself and she wants to fix it. But there is a whole nother aspect to her character, a little bit more backstory about her relationship with their mom. So even if we don't agree with it, we can at least have an explanation as to why she is the way that she is. So now after this book, I can confidently say that I really love Nesta. We don't just hate her for her attitude or the shit she's pulled anymore. We can sympathize with her character. And honestly, like it kind of makes you also think that even the most despicable people in the world probably weren't born that way. And you just have no idea what people are dealing with. Anyways, that wraps up this extraordinarily long wrap up. Thank you so much for watching. I gotta run or I'm gonna be late to my appointment. Thanks for watching, bye.